Welcome back to the show. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Kate O'Neill, who's a CEO and Chief Tech Humanist at KO Insights. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Kate, you've written several books. You're about to release another book. Tell us a little bit about what topics you choose to write about. Well, it's been an evolution uh, through the intersection of technology, business, and humanity. And so uh, each of those, each of the books uh, has really taken a little bit different spin. So uh, four books ago, for example, Pixels in Place, I was looking at the integration of physical and digital experience and how we could make that better for for humans. (laughs) And then looked at, in a broader sense, uh, at Tech Humanist, uh, really thinking about how we can think about technology and its impact on humans uh, in general and how we can think within business about creating systems that are more rewarding for uh, with technology for humans. And then A Future So Bright was, was looking at you know, this larger picture of um, how could we use technology to actually create a better future for us. Mm-hmm. And what matters next is uh, the next one coming out in January 2025. And the, the premise there is looking at uh, th- what what's left to do is to help leaders make better decisions about technology. And that's really the gap I see as, as we deal with AI and automation and all these kind of emerging tech issues. Uh, leaders are really stuck, I feel, you know, trying to figure out how do I make these big sweeping decisions that are going to have lasting impact, that are going to be exponentially amplified, that are going to affect, you know, culture and my workplace and all these things. I just don't have a good handle on it. So this is what I, I tried to unpack and what matters next. I think that's such an important area because I think the the generative AI, large language models are largely being developed by AI researchers, and they're very good at understanding technology. Um, they're understanding; they're good at understanding transformer architectures and building these models. But their specialty um, isn't how this technology is used, how it's incorporated into our everyday lives, especially in the workplace. And I feel like the lens that you bring is one where it's now taking that element of okay, what does life look like when you introduce this technology? and bring it in the hands of everyday consumers and and then, of course, uh, office workers as well. Um, In this book that you're writing, uh, what are some of the critical insights that you want to make sure come across to the audience? Yeah, I think, you know, just to back up your point there just a moment is to say, you know, the work that I've been doing over the last few years uh, has largely been with uh, senior leaders, executive leaders, and they are generally hamstrung about where to go internally, because as you say, their internal tech resources are often not the people who are uh, the warmest and fuzziest when it comes to humans and human experiences. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a gross generalization sometimes, but it can be true. And then otherwise, if they're looking to their, say, sales team or their marketing team for insights and, and guidance, those people don't necessarily have a very good handle on what technological capabilities or limitations there are. So it's it's a really tough uh, spot for for executive leaders to be in, and looking at that through the lens of of what what matters next uh, offers, I've been trying to to break down some of the the daunting uh, feeling of the future for for leaders as they think about decision making, as they think about you know using AI and using you know thinking about some of these big decisions that they have in front of them, you know how can we uh, position those decisions in a way that harnesses some human wisdom, some good old fashioned human wisdom mm-hmm. and you know, helps them see those decisions in a larger span of context of the through line of what they have understood about the past to what they you know, can anticipate about the future. And so that is the, the work that I've been doing is, is this taking this tech wisdom approach to this work and, and uh, allowing leaders to to build upon what they already understand, the insights mm-hmm. they already have about their business, and then apply that in, in the context of AI and technology. With the generative AI um, models that are out there and the use cases there, what are some of the challenges that these leaders are facing in, in perhaps the adoption of this technology in the lives of, of, of the workforce? Yeah, some of the things that I see happening very often, first of all, I see a lot of emphasis on the technology itself. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. people think, 
you know, we're going to talk about digital transformation, therefore we're going to talk about technology. And it's like, yes, that's true, and also that is not the extent of this conversation. We very much need to be talking about culture. We need to be talking about human capabilities. We need to be talking about you know, the behavioral readiness within the organization for the kinds of changes that, that we're going to be uh, you know, disseminating throughout the organization. Uh, those things are, are a little bit tricky to, to kind of take inventory of and lay in place. Um, sometimes the technology is the easiest part <laughs> in some ways. So those are some of the things I see happening is that, uh, you know, organizations are often feeling uh, like a little too focused on the technology and the technology mm -hmm. itself feels stressful, but they haven't actually looked at it in the context of, well, you know, what is it we exist to do as a company? You know, mm -hmm. what are we about? What's our purpose and our mission? And then how can we use this technology that we're talking about to, to you know, kind of amp amplify and accelerate how we go about how we meet the market around that purpose. It's like I always say, you know, when I used to work in enterprise organizations, I remember the days when a manager or director used to come and sort of like slap a newspaper clipping down on my desk and it would be about cloud or whatever. And it would be like, what's our cloud strategy? And it's like, we don't have a cloud strategy. We have a strategy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cloud yeah. may or may not be a part of how we deploy that strategy, but it's not a cloud strategy per se. And in the same way, we, we should not be thinking about our AI strategy in so many words, we should be thinking about our strategy, what it is we are trying to accomplish, and whether and how AI helps us get there. I think that's an incredible response because I think I think you're absolutely right. I think people like hung up on the technology itself, and technology is just an enabler, right? It's just a means to get to a final destination. But really, is what is that final destination, right? What is that journey you want? What are you trying to accomplish? How does the new technology that's emerging, which may or may not be the right answer, by the way, it's not like new technology is here and it's going to solve everything, right? Um, uh, so I think I think that's really part of it, and. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think the, some of the easiest parts of, of doing this work that we're all doing around generative AI is the technology part. The technology part is like a known, it's, it's a little bit easier to work with and, and get that solved. But just because you have the technology doesn't mean that people will buy it or adopt it or use it or find value from it. That's where the whole change management piece comes in, right? Getting the culture of the organization to go and interact well with the technology that's emerging and figure out ways to go and weave that into the workflows. Um, because one of the things that we see working in regulated spaces like banking and insurance is even if you introduce something that is very capable, is going to go and improve the lives or experiences of the, the people, or at least should, you hit certain gridlocks, right? Certain certain friction. Maybe it's an adoption from the end users. They're like, I don't want to learn a new tool or, or have a change in my process. I like the way that things were before. And right. then it's like dead in the water, right? And I think that piece is often forgotten about when people think about um, you know, the paths or the stages in the process that you need to go through to really get meaningful enterprise adoption and ultimately ROI from this new technology. It seems like it's such a good point that you make because I think one of the things that we are overlooking in this moment that we're in is the skills that managers and leaders need within organizations. You know, one of the things that I've been talking about for a couple of years is uh, as it relates to the future of work and the future of jobs and the the uh, the future of the workplace, really, as we thought about through COVID and uh, people working more often remotely and out of offices, and now with the the big push to return to office, there's there's this sense that I have that one of the reasons why we don't seem to understand what we're doing in that space is because we haven't really trained managers to manage remote and distributed teams around what knowledge work really is. Like we don't have measurable ways to talk meaningfully about. What, what our work is. And this has been true in, in coding for so long, right? Like the whole notion of measuring uh, productivity of software developers by lines of code. And, you know, obviously every software developer out, uh, out there is probably like rolling their eyes and going like, yeah, it's been a really big problem for a really long time. Because as we know, most often or, or very often, some of the most elegant solutions are actually shorter, but you're going to be sort of docked for your sense of productivity if you're, the number of lines you've written is fewer than, than it would have otherwise been. This is true with writing. This is true with so many mm -hmm. different kinds of things. And now as we look to 
a workplace where we're quote unquote collaborating with generative AI tools. And, you know, some of the, the work that we're doing is in sort of refining prompts and understanding what a really good question looks like and how we can really get at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. Those are really good moments to kind of get clear on our insights and on our purpose, but we're not necessarily looking very productive if what we're uh, if we're being monitored for the kinds of interactions that we're having with our our computers at that time. So we we need to be able to step back from this moment with a, a little bit better sense of how we manage and how we lead, how we motivate people, how we kind of draw out the best work from people when uh, when that work is not easily sort of reduced to very concrete pieces that can be measured. And it's not just packets that we're pushing through a system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking at the work that you've done with customers of yours, maybe let's walk through a successful version of this where an organization had the right frame, went through the right steps to really adopt new technology in a way where um, it had like the human experience in mind and, and the well-being of, 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 of the people involved in mind. Um, could we walk through one of those stories that you've had? Yeah, one of my favorites, and I think it's kind of a classic, is there's a utility company in South America that was looking at um, replacing uh, or, or enhancing some of their customer service function with conversational AI. So they wanted to roll in some chatbot features. And what they were thinking was, uh, we don't necessarily want to replace the people who are working in our call center. We want to make sure that they're as effective as they can be if we can gain efficiencies there and you know reduce the, the number of people having to work in support, then there will be some, some, uh, some benefit to that. But we also want to make sure that we're not you know, making silly cuts. We're not just cutting people for the sake of cutting people. Like if we can take those people and reskill them and add, add insight to the organization, we want to do that. So they were very thoughtful about how they wanted to, you know, why they wanted to roll this tool in. It was largely about making sure the customer experience was first and foremost. Could, could customers get mm -hmm. to an answer faster if they were using a chat bot than if they were calling into an 800 number or the equivalent in, in yeah, Latin America? Yeah. Right. So could they get to an answer faster? Like if it was just about changing a password or if it was just about accessing their account or whatever, could they get where they needed to go? And if it was more esoteric and needed more emotional intelligence than that, then obviously they were going to want a human uh, interactor. And how quickly could we determine that? How could we write a sort of if then experience that would sort those kinds of things as as efficiently as possible and get people who needed people to to interact with those support agents when they could. And then the process then became this kind of um, intelligence and insight adding experience. Like how can we continually review the logs, continually look at the analytics and look at those analytics, not as just reports and data, but look mm -hmm. at them as human experiences and really look to how can we pull cohorts of experiences out of that that say these people were looking for this kind of a process and this kind of a flow and they didn't get it they, they it took too long to get them the answer they needed um, so let's bring so and so and so and so who used to be answering phone calls but now don't have to answer phone calls let's have them participate in a process where they're helping to generate some of the best class best in class answers to these questions or help us refine what the flow looks like. This is a very sophisticated process. It is so much more than what just popping a chat bot into the website and hoping mm -hmm. for the best. You know, I think that it really demonstrates a very thoughtful approach to the, the process of, of bringing conversational AI into their process. I think that's right. I think the, in some ways, ChatGPT has done a disservice where, um, because of that as a consumer, you start finding value from just using a simple interface where you're asking a question, getting a response, or you're doing a simple search like on Google and you're getting a response. You think that that sort of experience is the right experience for, for, for workers, right? And the workflows that they, that they do. And often cases that that's not, right? Um, but you have to realize that some of the present experiences are, are, are pretty good or valuable. And you might want to retain some of those experiences as well. You also don't want to go in and force the, the people that have been doing this work for a very long time to go and rip and replace their existing flow uh, and process for something that may, may not be additive to what they do. So it really 
starts with understanding who it is that you serve, which in this case might be like internal employees that are trying to get work done better. And better could mean better quality uh, responses to the end customer. Better could mean being able to do more volume of work in the same amount of time or resolving tickets quicker in a customer support use case. But knowing how, what does that work look like today? What systems do they interface with? How do they search for information? How do they um, create responses? And then which parts of those process are adding the most friction or most time? And then kind of reverse engineering based off of that, the technology that you would need to go and introduce and also introducing it in a way where perhaps you're not changing their process. Um, and so like as a technologist, the way I think about it is like you deliver API first um, experiences, which is it's going to retain their experience more or less the same, but there are going to be parts that are going to be faster, and easier, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, um, exactly. So, so I'll, I'll give you an example, Kate, because I think I think you might appreciate this and, and, and curious what your thoughts are. Um, you know, a lot of times, like there are a lot of internal use cases where you're searching for information, right? It's a it's a retrieval problem, um, and you think that okay, well, why don't we just throw a chatbot and you could ask a question and it'll surface a response. That's, that adds sometimes more friction than it's worth because first, it takes 20 seconds for that chatbot to come up with a response. It also comes up with a response that's gonna be a single paragraph and it doesn't give you any backup options to go and peruse through. So in some ways, you'd rather have a really fast and efficient process where you ask a question, imagine more like a Google search experience, and it gives you a litany of, 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 of responses where it's stack ranked based on um, some similarity based on the question and, and such. And then you could click in and then, then you can identify which documents actually really are closest in um, in the scope of the answer that you want. And then you have that chat experience, right? So it's not like the chat experience necessarily is the is the wrong answer. It's just like where in that sequence do you introduce it? Because by doing it in a two-step or three-step process, that fast search allows you to narrow the scope of the, the search that the chatbot then needs to work on. And then the chatbot can summarize or synthesize or you know, do some Q&A experience. But you really have to have those business users that work alongside the technologist and whoever's in charge of product to create that really great product experience, right? So it feels fluid. And then at that time, you have great adoption because you have the end users in mind in designing the solution from the very beginning. Yeah, I think that's so right. I love that you bring that that up and the, the focus on how that works in that flow, because I, I just was doing a keynote uh, for an insurance organization. And I, I, I used that chat, but the, you know, the sort of utility conversational AI example in a Q&A uh, interaction. And one of the people in the audience came up to me afterwards and she wanted to make sure to point out that one of the things that, that's adding the most value in their organization is actually using those kinds of, of sort of conversational AI prompts and responses for internal brokers serving internal resources. Mm -hmm. So not so much the external customers calling in and not ha knowing how to navigate the taxonomy of the organization and you know trying mm -hmm. to deal with that level of of um, information management, but rather the the internal information management more like an intranet, you know kind of helping people yeah. navigate yeah. how they get to the most relevant piece of information, how they can reduce the duplic you know duplicates of their environment. And this coming from someone who has worked around intranets for many, many years, that really, really resonated with me because, you know, it was back in the early 2000s when I was working for Hospital Corporation of America and on their next generation intranet, we were putting, you know, in, uh, guided navigation and search interfaces over top of this, uh, this data architecture that it was so about making sure that we could provide a, a variety of interfaces that people could use to find, you know, sort of either faceted navigation or search or whatever was going to be the right way for them to get in. It would have been so fantastic to offer them also some yeah. kind of generative AI interface. But I also would be very curious to your point if it would actually be more cumbersome in many cases. And so we would want to be testing that and making sure. And I think it's a really good challenge for anyone listening as they're thinking about how to enhance the workflow in their organization that a generative AI interface or a chatbot isn't necessarily going to be the answer unless we know for sure that that is actually going to, you know, provide the right kind of interaction and architecture to, to the environment. So it's such a That's great right. reminder. That's, yeah, no, it is. I agree. And I, I appreciate that challenge for the audience to think through that. Right. And I think in some ways, like we're so early on in working with generative AI um, that maybe the initial user experiences that we have are, are not the, 
I would say maybe they're, they're not the paradigm that gets adopted in mass, right? Like the chatbot, the Q&A, the co-pilot experience that, that, that we have been engineering the past year, maybe in due time, like they become the minority set of experiences that we introduce. And I think maybe the more, more recent like hot topic has been these AI agents for agentic workflows, mm-hmm. which are essentially what, you know, what, they, what they do, if you kind of distill it, is they, they have a series of thoughts uh, they observe like where, what, where that information may live, and then they take actions, right? So mm-hmm. you go through thoughts, observations, and actions, like this chain of, uh, of, of thought in order to get to the right outcome. And so they're doing what people would normally do, but they're doing it programmatically. And so they're coming to you with a more finished final state product, which for certain workflows, those are incredible. And so now right. the human operator doesn't have to go and ask questions through a chatbot like interface and then go through the motions. Those are all being done programmatically by this agentic workflow. And then people kind of pick up um, the process. And if the agentic part can't figure it out, then it says like, hey, like this thing I can't handle, a human operator comes in. But then it's the balance of like how to figure out when should the AI um, hand off to a human operator, right? How do you kind of manage the switchboard there? But it could be that this becomes a new paradigm. I'm not saying it will, but there are many different experiences beyond the chatbot experience that right. everyone's accustomed to that may become the norm. Exactly. No, I think that's a really good uh, takeaway from this part of the conversation is, is just that, you know, it, it's not we're in, we're so early in this process yeah. and we don't have the, the, the modalities and paradigms that are probably going to become dominant in a few years, but also that it's important to remember I, I just to bring it back out to a higher level of, of thinking about the human experience, you know, one of the things that I constantly uh, endeavor to remember in my writing and my research and my speaking is that what's fundamental to the human experience is meaning and meaning making. Mm-hmm. And, you know, asking the right questions, uh, you know, getting to where we're allowing those questions to provoke good insights that can then help us make better decisions that. Um, also as an offshoot of those insights that we have the opportunity to sort of recognize and store foresights for later understanding those, those are incredible processes. And the more we try to, um, replicate those processes in the flow of our, of the intelligence that we use, the artificial intelligence that we build and the the machine intelligence that augments our decision-making, the better our decisions are likely to be. So, you know, it's, it's all about making sure that we are uh, introspective enough and thoughtful enough about ourselves to be able to sort of build the right type of support and augmentation in the tools Mm -hmm. that we're using to, to enhance our work. Completely agree. I think maybe switching gears here a little bit, I'm very curious um, what organizations sometimes get wrong um, that leads to poor outcomes. Because I'm a big fan of you know, learning from the, all that collective scar tissue. And I think you would be a great individual that has um, figured out what not to do that I think would be very valuable for our audience to, to hear. Yeah, and I like that scar tissue metaphor. That's a, a very valuable uh, analogy for people to remember. I think, you know, I, we talked a little bit about one example of what organizations get wrong, and that's too much focus on technology without thinking first about purpose. I, I um, wrote about this in uh, Tech Humanist, the idea of uh, human-centric digital transformation. This is a, a concept that's very popular now, but it was one that, uh, that I was um, very early on. So uh, if not the coiner of that, that phrase, I'm not sure. But the, um, the concept of really getting to, again, meaning is so central to the human experience and the human condition that what the, the shape that meaning takes in business is purpose. So if we really want to have an understanding of what it is we're trying to do in an organization, we have to get at it from that lens of meaning, which is purpose. And purpose here is not this sort of fuzzy, abstract concept of, you know, uh, a feel-good, touchy-feely sort of thing. It is really more about that very essential distillable three to five word articulation of what it is your company exists to do and is trying to do at scale, right? And if you have that understanding, you can really do so much better at helping people, helping humans be motivated and feel connected to the work they're doing. 
and you can help AI and other machine uh, entities function more efficiently. Like purpose actually enhances both sides of that sort of quasi collaboration equation in the human and machine environment. So I've seen companies get that wrong and, and mm -hmm. definitely go racing, you know, too aggressively into the, into technology. I mean, we've seen so many sad examples of say newsrooms cutting their editorial staff, you know, really yeah. aggressively and, and preempting what they really had the capability to do in a, in a sane and sensible way. Uh, yeah. in their organizations, right? Uh, and there have been many other examples that I'm sure we could cite of um, of AI uh, and algorithmic decision-making being uh, adopted too readily in uh, insurance, in finance, in uh, law enforcement, criminal justice. And I, I go through some of these examples in the book and What Matters Next. Um, mm -hmm. And we, I'm sure there are, there are many, many examples that, that are out there I think that the key takeaway here is for leaders to understand that there's so much value that can come from modeling your environment and data and using algorithmic information around you, you know, supporting yourself with algorithmic processes and using AI and machine learning to, uh, to add some efficiency in the organization, but ultimately the context, the, the contextual awareness, the emotional intelligence, the sort of understanding of good judgment and what matters in a moment is going to come down to humans to to decide. Mm -hmm. uh, so really bringing that human in the loop consideration back into it, I think is is uh, so important and is so often overlooked. So those uh, I'm sure you have some some great stories too, Ankur, and, and things you've seen go wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. And I think I've, I've learned from them, which is like for us in, in the workflows that we work on in, in automating, well, we try to frame what the value add is that we're trying to bring to the table, right? And I think that when that value add becomes apparent, we start making more friends than 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 foes, right? Um, in terms of like, there's they're 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 now asking for the technology to be part of uh, of of what they do. So I'll just give you an example. We work a lot on lending use cases, uh, and this is also true if you do claims processing, any anything that involves some intake or submission process. But in lending, like a mortgage application, you have loan officers that are very well trained to go and help um, speed up the lending uh, workflow, right? They, they work with applicants, make sure their packet's complete. They make sure that all the information is ready to go for an underwriter um, and the underwriter makes a decision and the, the, the loan officer is then working with the applicant to get the decision out to them so they could hopefully you know, win on that opportunity, right? They could get something done. Um, but unfortunately, like half of their day, sometimes more is spent on reading in documents, figuring out if all the documents that they need are present. If they are, they pull that information out. Then they check basically all that information against all the other docs and the application. It's like a lot of administrative work that has to get done. It's essential, but essentially is it's it's like grunt work, right? It's like after a while, like you, you've done it so many times, it's no longer fun or challenging. It's more more administrative in nature. That is the type of work that large language models, generative AI is really good at it. You can do document reasoning and understanding, help do document extraction, and then and then um, go and help make decisions. And the applicants, of course, get better experiences because they get decisions faster, they get a mortgage um, outcome a little bit more quicker. Um, and then the business benefits, because as, as the faster you get a decision out to the applicant, the better chance you have of capturing the underwriting dollars and kind of the, the opportunity there. Uh, and the loan officers, they're spending more of their time on the more high value, more complex work, right? And and I, I think that going back to, to your, your frame earlier, is like, for the loan officers that adopt the new technology aren't uh, maybe maybe so averse to it. Again, the technology has to help uh, make their lives easier by you know, keeping their experience in their loan origination system intact. So making sure they don't have to go switch back and forth between systems. Uh, but the end experience would be where loan officers spend more of their time reviewing information versus having to do the data entry. And so they could see more applications in a given day. They could spend more time working with the applicant or with the underwriting team. It's more high EQ. Um, activity, it's it's an you know, activity that they find more purpose from. So I do think that the in terms of making sure the dignity of the workers there and, and that they get value from it, I think generative AI is a huge enabler for that. Um, and I'm very curious your thoughts on this, which is, isn't Gen AI and, and like automation that happens maybe off of it, isn't that additive to the human experience? Because then people are having 
better time working on the things they really want to be and maybe more of the administrative work comes off their plate. Um, so I'm curious, like what about that is, uh, are people uh, maybe aware, like wary of um, and, and perhaps get wrong when they think about restoring or improving the human condition? Yeah, I, th I think it's such a great point and question because I think we, we have made this assumption over the last few years. Uh, and, and I think before the chat GPT, you know, 2022 revolution, we, uh, in talking about AI in the abstract, as most people had experienced it to that point, uh, it was the sense that, oh, what we're going to need to do with automation and AI is uh, automate the busy work and keep all the meaningless stuff, you know, take the mundane stuff away so that we can focus on the more meaningful stuff. And that's true. Of course, that makes a total, it makes total sense, right? And except that one of the things that we are not figuring into that equation is that if all we're automating is the busy work, if all we're doing is creating an environment where everything has been automated to scale and it's the mundane and meaningless stuff, then those are the experiences that surround us. <laughs> we haven't really fostered meaningfulness in those experiences. So I think there's a, a really uh, interesting kind of give and take that needs to happen where, again, sort of coming back to um, even your your uh, underwriting and, and loan processing example uh, or the utility customer mm -hmm. call center example, either of those are examples of thinking about um, how can we sort of abstract that process as a whole, you know, kind of think about it in the broad strokes first. And then as we maybe iterate through the process, how can we add more nuance to that process? How can we, it, it may be about more structured data or more structured interactions. It may be about less structured data. It may be about saying like, let's, let's allow the person who's interacting with this system to make more of a judgment call here and, and mm -hmm. have it be less guided by a structure. Um, it, and there, there are going to be a lot of different variables. And I think that's what, what feels like the opportunity here over the, ne the next generation of generative AI and of, of automation is to be thinking about the specifics of deployment and how these infrastructural solutions meet the environment that they're in and provide the best opportunity for this balance of removing mundanity and adding meaning back in to the experiences that people are having both with their work and with the experiences that they're having with their, you know, the services that they do business with. I think that looking all around the whole equation for the meaning we can add back in is, is sort of is key. Yeah. I, I'd like yeah. to say, you know, m we cannot leave meaning up to machines to determine, <laughs> like that's our sure. thing. <laughs> so yeah. it's all about making sure we're putting the meaning back into those processes. I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's about making sure that the individuals that uh, are going to be affected to some some extent uh, uh, are are part of that that table um, discussing how the technology should be introduced. Right. So going back to the loan officer, the loan processing use case, the loan officer has agency in, in reviewing the outputs. They're the, still the final authority, especially because there's fiduciary risk and responsibility. But their meaning, in my view, and, and this is also what I hear from from loan officers, is is making sure the applicant gets a decision, right? Mm -hmm. And ideally, hopefully the decision that we're hoping for, but get to the decision as quickly as possible so they could go in and 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 live the rest of their lives and like get a home that they want, right? And like just get to the final state. And so the idea here is that the loan officers derive value from making sure the applicants get a really incredible outcome. And this technology is helping them get to that faster and serve more applicants, right? So on net, they're able to have more impact. Um, but how it's introduced um, and, uh, and and how it weaves into their process, these, these are critical areas. But ultimately, it's, you're taking some of the more administrative work off their plate while still giving them the agency to go and interact with the parties that they love to interact with and to deliver that best possible outcome, right? And I think I think um, the more you can frame it from the perspective of the user, the better. While while it's of course you know you're, you're still making the experience for the customer better and the organization uh, better on on net as well. Yeah, I think it's it's about thinking dimensionally about experience and about human experience all throughout the organization and how you operationalize that. And you know, using tools like generative AI to do it. 
um, are, it's an incredible opportunity, but also it usually builds upon underlying, uh, discipline and underlying mm-hmm. understanding of the organization, right? There, there needs to be some kind of fundamental insight about, again, coming back to that sort of central sense of purpose and strategy. Uh, but even in the, in the areas of um, the, where the, the, product, the products and offerings are, are built out in different ways, like do we have the right product set to, to serve the right customers? Are we thinking... Mm-hmm about you know these these loan products are they are they the right set are we are we gearing them the right way you know when we get these results back are we looking at who's getting rejected and yeah. why are they getting rejected can we can we glean anything from that about you know where we're going wrong maybe with how we're uh, marketing these things or how, you know what we might do better to to better educate consumers before they come into the to the moment where they're applying for this thing and getting rejected so there's this huge opportunity to mm-hmm. think structurally in ways that go well above and beyond the the generative AI interaction, uh, and that all has to do with strategy and with tech wisdom. As we come back to you know at that at that top level of yep. of thinking holistically about how all these things connect and and making sure that we're doing the best job we can to to um, to live the fullness of the idea of what an organization is supposed to be in every way that we possibly can. Mm-hmm. How could or, uh, leaders effectively communicate the value and impact of AI initiatives to various stakeholders, from employees to, to customers? Uh, because that's one of the big challenges that we see with customers and leaders, well, really leaders trying to go and introduce net new initiatives to the organization. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's a scary premise to people that AI is going to take their jobs, right? But I, I think one of the things that we we don't do a very good job of understanding is thinking about the displacement of tasks rather than jobs and about re-bundling different types of, of labor and roles, really thinking about, you know, who's doing uh, what kind of functions and how can, if we erode some of those functions, and those functions are now being handled by uh, by automated intelligence. You know, what is the value add that someone who understands the adjacency of of that uh, that automation can now add that adds nuance back into the organization? It's like I think when when we think about uh, marketing, for example, uh, or we think about customer support. Um, customer support is not just about transactionality, right? It's not just about how do we take this call, get the answer, and get off the phone. It's mm-hmm. about this body of insights that gets amassed and aggregated over time about what we've done wrong, what we could do better. It's like we were talking before about the the idea that we could maybe market our loan products better or whatever. Um, the the opportunity is enormous for us to to build insights and wisdom around whatever that the, those interactions are telling us. So marketing, for example, is at its best when it's a knowledge center for the entire organization. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true about AI tools. If, if we're wise about the way we lead and the way we, we organize our, organ, uh, our, our <laughs> I was going to say organize our organizations, and then I couldn't think quickly enough of something <laughs> that isn't that, uh, but the way that we lead our organizations and how we uh, think about reskilling and upskilling, um, mm. those opportunities are not um, quite so clear cut, and it's not so drastic as as I think many many workers and many leaders think. I think people think it's a sort of one and done sort of like, oh, my job is eliminated now, and uh, and now I have to go figure out something else to do. And very yeah. often the opportunity is so much more nuanced than that. Yeah. If if the leaders and the managers in an organization are willing to to be more invested and more sophisticated in the process, and it's worth it because there's so much human capital that we stand to lose, and so much you know emotional investment in the success of the company, and uh, so much understanding and insight that's been gleaned along the way, and morale and motivation that are all part and parcel of the culture of the company that we stand to lose if we don't think about how can we reinvest that human capital in ways that actually is additive to the the automation that we've built into the the process. Mm -hmm. Not to say that you can never let go of an employee, 
But I think that doing that must be something that we're considering very seriously sure. as only the last alternative to something that actually builds value back into the organization. How could leaders upskill their teams for AI? Could you share a quick blueprint for that? Yeah, I think so much of it has to do with um, this this new method of learning and thinking about, mm -hmm. you know, insights and, and foresights, you know, really thinking like we were talking before about we, we know uh, many of us who have been using generative AI tools and prompt based interactions that so much about that that process teaches you to ask better questions. And what's so interesting to me about so, for example, when we think about how educators in schools are so resistant to uh, yeah. chat-based uh, interactions for their students, like, oh, you're not allowed to use ChatGPT to write essays. If I were an yeah. educator, I would 100% be having my students use ChatGPT to write essays because I think that what it does is teaches you to be very crisp about what you're asking. And I would have them document the process. My first prompt was this, it got this kind of response. The next prompt I wrote was this, and it got this kind of response. It was still, it was close, but I still wanted to have it write it with more of this tone. And then I did that and like, whoa, it way overcompensated. Now I gotta pull back on it. It's such a great learning process. And what's more is that that learning process teaches us how to communicate to other people about what it is we want and how to mm -hmm. distill our preferences. So it's an incredible opportunity for students and people who are just learning in the environment uh, of, of prompt-based, you know, sort of chat interactions. I think that we have so much opportunity in our organizations to allow people to, to really relearn how to learn and how to interact with their, their own jobs and with the work that they're trying to produce and try to get better results, try to outperform themselves and then yeah. teach that information, teach that insight back into the organization, make the organization more effective, more resilient, more future ready, and just build that, that, uh, that knowledge and that wisdom over time. Yeah. I think if the students of today don't learn how to use new tools or available to them, right, including generative AI and ChatGPT and others, yeah. they'll be ill-suited to come to the marketplace because um, those that will be using the tools will be just much more productive, much more efficient. Um, and so I think that skill set has to be developed uh, early on, like I, I think in schooling environments. So um, absolutely agree on that. Um, what are some things that are make you a little bit fearful about maybe the path of, of AI currently, the current trajectory? Um, and what are some things that you think could help mitigate some of that? Yeah, we, we alluded to some of it already in the sense that I am concerned about uh, people uh, sort of delegating all decision making to AI and algorithms. You know, it's like uh, the, the concept that tech is neutral is totally false. You know, tech is not neutral. Tech is, is based on what we build. You know, we are the ones who... Uh, determine what data we're collecting. We determine the data models that we build. We determine the algorithms. We determine, uh, you know, the entire thing is based on our particular biases as well as our values, you know. So these, mm -hmm. are, these are important structures that underlie what we're doing. Uh, so I have, a little, I have some concerns that, uh, that we don't have the appropriate level of sort of circumspection about how we're using uh, the guidance from AI systems to to make decisions. And then in addition to that, I think the um, the environment that we're in, the times that we're in and, and the 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 kind of corporate structures that exist, you know, with many trillion dollar companies uh, forming, you know, this this kind of disparity of, of equity and ownership mm -hmm. Uh, and the landscape of who owns that data and who owns the the decision making around that data that's a very troubling sort of premise for thinking about the decades ahead of us um, so it's it's challenging to try to navigate how how we're going to um, set up the best possible outcomes for yeah. AI interactions and the best experiences that humans can have you know really thriving in this environment where we are we're augmented by the, the best possible outcomes without succumbing to the worst possible outcomes of, you know, this, this sort of corporate behemoth ownership of data and not relinquishing any control and having, you know, all rights to all of our uh, decision making and insights and, and that sort of thing. It's just there's there's yeah. any number of bad dystopic outcomes that, that play out on that side that. Mm -hmm counterbalance the sort of utopian outcomes that I envision of, um, you know, the, yeah. 
the sustainable development goals being able to be met because we're using AI at scale and, you know, those kinds of things that uh, these things are very much both real sides of the equation. Yep. It's just that we, we have a lot of work to do to sort out both of those sides of the equation. Those are incredible insights, Kate. Really appreciate that. Um, for our audience, where could they learn more about you and hear more about the upcoming book? Yeah, I'd I love to hear from the audience and continue the conversation. I'm, I'm at koinsights.com. And I am constantly sharing stuff on, on there. I join my mailing list and you'll get lots of thoughts from me. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn or um, I used to be Twitter. Now it's threads more often. You can find me at threads at Kate O'Neill. Uh, I'm always talking about AI and leadership uh, over on those platforms. And then, of course, the next book is What Matters Next. And that comes out in January 2025. And uh, I hope that people will be able to pick it up and, and tell me what what difference it makes for them. That's incredible, Kate. We'll make sure to include that in the show notes and, and look forward to a future conversation here because I think this space is early. I think you have a really great read on how this technology can be adopted. And we'll see uh, in, in due time some, some of the open challenges that remain, right, and how, how organizations have um, work to, to go and adopt this technology either well or not so well. So very much looking forward to that future conversation. But it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure uh, having you on the podcast here. Same, Anchor. Thank you so much.